welcome you to the epilogue of my book, Valley of Dry Bones Live Again, Rebuilding the Walls of Our Torn Down Life. And this should conclude the book on video. If you're interested in getting a copy of the video, the whole book, you can email me or you can contact me and I'll be more than happy to see to it that you get a copy. Uh, you can get a copy of the book on Barnes & Nobles or Amazon. Okay, now the basis of the book, just to summarize the book up so that you'll know exactly where I'm going with it. The Assyrians had lost control of their empire when their leader, Ashurbanipal, had died. The Assyrians' empire began to crumble at that point. Now, I believe the Assyrians' opponents knew that Ashurbanipal took his victories with him to his grave. Uh, that's when the enemy began to attack harder and bring the Assyrian Empire down once and for all. I believe it was out of, basically out of revenge. Okay, now the enemy attacked the Assyrians with constant and continuous brutality until there was nothing left but a valley of dry bones. Now some tried to make peace, but I'm sure that they still, you know, some probably tried to make peace, but they still lost because the attack was probably so fierce. Okay, they fought a good fight, but lacked the discipline, partly I believe because the Assyrians had been successful for so many years, but their success they took for granted. And if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Okay, they didn't think twice about their victory because their leader probably was the one that dictated everything. Uh, when they began to lose, that's when they probably changed their fighting partners and tried to make peace. I believe that's what it says that they tried to turn over to that point. Now, the Assyrians perfected early techniques of imperial rule. They invented it. Other empires adopted the Assyrians' technique and began stand, uh, became standard for them Okay, from that point on. The Assyrians were the first to be armed with iron weapons and their troops were the first to be employed and advanced military tactics. They got the job done without fail. They won every battle. And we are going to win every battle. We're going to win this battle and every battle after. Jerusalem wasn't the only city to be destroyed, however. The urban and military center in the Shephelah were also laid waste and all of the governmental apparatus of the army of Judah caused a uh, cease to exist. Okay, they came to the collapse of the outlying settlements of, of the Jordan Valley and along the western shore of the of the, the sea, the Negev, the southern hills of Judah and the southern Shephelah, which led to there being nothing left but dead bodies left in the entire city and the outlying cities as well. Now, that those that weren't killed left the city, I'm sure, with what they had or probably just left with the clothes that they had on their back. Uh, but the annihilation, the banishment, the national catastrophe that happened was only the beginning of a brand new stage in the history of its people. Many people came to Assyria to celebrate Passover, which attributed to the large number of people being killed, including innocent people, elders, families, and their children. Never had there been such a destruction, never ha had there been so much destruction Okay, to so many of the cities uh, simultaneously. The attack previously would have stopped with the attack on Syria, on Assyria, because Assyria would have won. Okay, but after the Babylonian captivity of the Persian conquest of Babylonia, Cyrus II of Persia allowed the Jews to return to Judea and rebuild the temple. The construction was finished in 516 BCE or 430 BCE. Then Artaxerus the first, or uh, possibly Darius the second, allowed Ezra and Nehemiah to return to rebuild the city's walls and to govern Judea, which was ruled as Yehud province under the Persians. Now, during the Second Temple period, especially during the Hasnanian period, the city walls were expanded and renovated, constituting what Jehoshaphat calls the first wall. Herod the Great added uh, Herod the Great added what Jehoshaphat what, what Josephus called the second wall somewhere in the area between today's Jaffa Gate and the Temple Mount. Agrippa the first later began the construction of the third wall, which was completed just at the beginning of the first Jewish Roman War. Some Romans 
uh, of this wall are located today near the Mandelbaum Gate gas station. In 70 CE, as a result of the Roman siege during the First Jewish-Roman War, the walls were almost completely destroyed. Jerusalem would remain in ruins for some six decades without protective walls for over two centuries. The pagan Roman city, Alia Capitolina, which was built over 130 by Emperor Hadrian, was at first left without protective walls. After some two centuries without walls, a new set of wall, uh, a new set was erected around the city, probably during the reign of Emperor Diocelian, sometime between 289 and the turn of the century. The walls were extensively renovated by the Empress Alia Udia Udica uh, during his banishment to Jerusalem. In 1033, most of the walls constructed by Eudicia were destroyed by an earthquake. They had to be rebuilt by the Fatlands, who left out the southernmost parts that had been previously included. Mount Zion, with its churches, and the southeastern hill, the city of David, with the Jewish neighborhoods, which stood south of the Temple Mount, period. In preparation for the expected crusader siege of 1099, the year 1099, the walls were strengthened yet again, but to little avail. The conquest brought some destruction following the reconstruction, as did the reconquest of Saladin in 1187. In 1202 to 1212, Saladin's nephew, al-Malik, Al Mazam Isa ordered the reconstruction of the city walls, but later in 1219 he reconsidered the situation after most of the watchtowers had been built and had the walls torn down, mainly because he feared that the Crusaders would benefit of the would benefit of the fortifications if they managed to reconquer the city. Now, for the next three centuries, the city remained without protective walls. The Temple Mount Haran, Ash Sharif, and the Citadel, then being the, one, the only well-fortified areas. In the 16th century, during the reign of the Ottoman Empire in the Great Region, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent decided to rebuild the city walls, fully, partly, on the remains of the ancient walls. Being built 1513 and 1538, they are the walls that exist today. During its long history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times, and destroyed twice. The people of Jerusalem, as well as the visitors who came there to celebrate Passover, had dreams and hopes just like you and I have dreams and hopes today. These people came to visit the city of Jerusalem for a holiday and were killed, but not able to live long enough to make their dreams a reality. They were brutally and selfishly killed. They were among the place, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Babylonians defeated the Assyrians according to the Babylonian Chronicles. There was a bitter 12 year struggle between Babylon and Assyria, as well as civil wars in Assyria itself. They described that in, uh, ten, in the tenth year of the Nabopolassar 616 BC, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrian army and marched up the river, sacking Main, Sahari, and Balahu. I'm sure these people had dreams. And they never suspected that they would be killed in a resurrection holiday like Passover. Now their dreams and hopes were shattered. Their hopes and dreams of their children were gone as well because the, everyone that was there was killed. They were dead. The walls of their dreams, their inhumanity and violently torn down with no hope in sight. It estimated that about 275,000 Assyrio Chaladins died between 1914 and 1918. 
The population of the Assyrian of the Ottoman Empire and Persia was about 600,000 before the genocide and was reduced by 275,000. With very few survivors in 1930s, Turkey or Iran. The Assyrian Empire and the Persian Empire were two of the earliest major empires of the world. The Assyrians were powerful from about 900 to about 600 BC. The Persian Empire came afterwards, holding power beginning around 550 BC. The Assyrians had a much more um, autocratic and centralized system of government. The world I live in was built on dreams. When you're feeling like all hope is gone and you've been beaten like a pulp, beaten, you know, beaten like a pulp, just remember your dream. Our dreams are visions given to us by God. When God gives us a vision, when God gives me a vision, I can accept that vision as reality or reject it. Then God, the God-given vision is a premonition of my destiny my divine and perfect future. You know the story of Joseph, right? When Ashurbanipal died, the empire crumbled. Attacks on Assyria did not stop until there was total annihilation of the city and its people. Even the visitors and the innocent bystanders and children were brutally murdered. The bodies began to pile up. The attackers were not going to stop until everyone was killed and everyone was dead. And that's what they did. Now I'm sure the Assyrians had dreams, visions, keeping their control and dominance on the military front because they were able to conquer the entire, the entire, uh, they were able to conquer entirety of Mesopotamia and were the first to use iron weapons, which were perfected by other cities as well. Okay, uh, the Assyrians had the largest standing army in the history of Mesopotamia. The Valley, Valley of Dry Bones did live again and the city was restored. People did regain hope and confidence, although sorrowful of the lost loved ones, I'm sure. Jerusalem was once again the holy city because as it was before. Jerusalem was restored to a religious and political center during biblical times and was once again the place where the temple of God stood. Many events in the life of Jesus took place there. This wasn't the first and it definitely was not the last event to take place. Wow, that's a, a story, definitely. That's the summary of what I've been talking about, what the book is based on. Uh, Valley of Dry Bones, Live Again, Rebuilding the Walls of Your Torn Down Life. Okay, and we are going to be in the process of rebuilding the walls of our torn down life. Now here's a prayer that I turned, I turned from scripture into prayer. And I call it a confession of obedience, and you'll find it in the epilogue section of the book, okay? And it reads thusly, Lord, I will fully obey you, Lord God. I will carefully keep all your commands that you are going giving me today and every day. The Lord my God will set me high above all nations of the world. I will experience all these blessings because I will obey the Lord my God in the name of Jesus. My towns and my fields will be blessed. My children and my crops will be blessed. The offspring of my herds and flocks will be blessed. My fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever I go and whatever I do will be blessed in the name of Jesus. The Lord will conquer my enemies when they attack me. They will attack me from one direction, but they will scatter from me in seven in the name of Jesus. The Lord will guarantee a blessing to me on everything that I do, and God will fill my storehouses with grain. The Lord my God will bless me in the land he is giving me. I will obey the commands of the Lord my God, and I will walk in his ways. The Lord God will establish me as his holy people, as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that I am a people claimed by the Lord, and they will stand in awe of me. The Lord will give me prosperity in the land he swore to my ancestors to give me, blessing me with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain all at the proper time from his rich treasury in heaven. 
and will bless all the work I do. I will lend to many nations, and I will never need to borrow from them, because I will listen to the commands of the Lord, my God, that God has given me today and every day, and I will carefully obey them. The Lord will make me the head and not the tail. And I will always be on top and never at the bottom. I will never turn away from any of the commands God is giving me today, nor will I follow after other gods and worship them. In the name of Jesus, I consider it done. Henceforth now forevermore, and it is so. Amen. Now here's another confession from the book of Psalms 3. Okay. I will never forget, Lord, the things that God has taught me. I will store his commands in my heart. Therefore, I will live many years, and my life will be satisfying. I will never let loyalty and kindness leave me. I will tie them around my neck as a reminder. I will write them down within my heart. Then I will find favor with, uh, with both God and people. And I will earn a good reputation. I will trust in the Lord with all my heart. And I will not depend on my own understanding. I will seek God, uh, God's will in all that I do. And God will show me which path to take. I won't be impressed with my own wisdom. Instead, I will fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then God promises I will have healing for my body and strength for my bones. I will honor the Lord with my wealth and the best part of everything that I produce. Then God will fill my barns with grain, my vats with overflow, with good wine. I will never reject the Lord's discipline, and I won't be upset when God corrects me. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. I will remain joyful, because I find wisdom and I gain understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than riches. Nothing you desire can compare to her. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. By wisdom the Lord founded the earth. By understanding he created the heavens. Uh, by God's knowledge, the deep fountains of the earth burst forth, and the dew settles beneath the, the night sky. I will never lose sight of common sense and discernment. I will hang on to them, for they will refresh my soul. They are like jewels on a necklace. They keep me safe in my way, and my feet will not stumble. I go to bed without fear. I lie down and sleep soundly. I need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. For the Lord is my security. He will keep my foot from being caught up in a trap. I will not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in my power to help them. If I can help my neighbor now, I won't say come back tomorrow and that I'll help you. I won't plot harm against my neighbor for those who live near, nearby trust me. I won't pick a fight without reason, uh, when no one has done in me harm. I won't envy violent people or copy their ways. Such wicked people are detestable to the Lord, but he offers his friendship to the godly. The Lord curses the house of the wicked, but he blesses my home because it is upright. The Lord mocks the mockers, but is gracious to me because I am humble. I am wise, there I inherit honor, but fools are put to shame in the name of Jesus. I consider it done, henceforth now forevermore, and it is so. Amen. Except the Lord build the house, you labor in vain. Now we need to trust in God and work circumspectly when it comes to rebuilding the walls of our torn down life, okay? And yes, we are going to need to rebuild the walls of our torn down life because uh, so many things come and go in our lives, especially with this coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, this has turned um, pretty much the economy upside down. 
never before has this been seen and before and I think they said in history in 19, 1930s during the Great Depression um, but they have said that the state will pick up and the, and the federal government will kick in and they are working on remedies so that we can get back to our normal lives whatever that means normal okay but we're going to trust in God for everything that he has and whatever thing that he does and know that God is always in control Okay, God is the, you know, sovereign God. He's, he's almighty and all-powerful. Okay, he's still God throughout the triumph and the tribulations, through the storm and the wind and the rain. He's still just as powerful as he was when the, everything was calm and peaceful. Okay, now Jer Jer Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says, uh, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made their Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along the riverbank with roots that reach top into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long moths of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. When I trust in God for my life, doors start opening. Blessings start coming my way. Promotions come. Health and healing is mine for the asking. I can be blessed with all this if I keep my life, if I give my life over to Jesus. Uh, what God has for me is for me. And that's all you need to do is give your life over to Jesus as well. Uh, now we must let go and let God take control of our situation so that he can help us to rebuild the walls of our torn down life. Ephesians 17, 4, 17 to 32, Amplified Version reads thusly. So this I say and solemnly affirm together with the Lord as his presence that you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility of their minds and in the foolishness and the emptiness of their souls for their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is clouded. They are alienated and self-banished from the life of God, faith with no, with no uh, share in it. This is because of the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is deep-seated within them because of their hardness and insensitivity to their heart. And they, the ungodly in their spiritual apathy, having become callous and unfeeling, have given themselves over as prey to unbridled uh, sensuality, eagerly craving the practice of every kind of impurity that their desires may demand. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If in fact you have really heard him and have been taught by him, just as truth is in Jesus, revealed in his life and personified in him, that regarding your pre previous way of life, you put off your old self, completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude, and put on a new self and regenerated and renewed nature, created in God's image, Godlike, in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. Okay, therefore rejecting all falsehood, whether lying, defrauding, telling half-truths, spreading rumors, any such of these, speak truth each one with his neighbor. For I am all parts of one another, and I am all parts of the body of Christ. Be angry at sin, at immortality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior. Yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you shame, nor allow you to last until the sun goes down. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge, or nurturing anger, or harboring resentment, or cultivating bitterness. The thief who has become a believer must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, making an honest living producing that which is good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. But do not let wholesome, foul, uh, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. Okay. Oh 
And do not give the devil an opportunity. Uh-oh. You speak. Oh, wait, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him, by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own, for the day of redemption of delivery from the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault-finding, and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, mal mal -volence, mal malevolence. Uh, be kind and helpful to one another, lender, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another re um, readily and freely just as God in Christ has also forgave you. Decide to stay away from sin, to avoid it no matter what. In order to do this, you are going to have to surrender to God. Put your arms in the air, and as you are kneeling, keep your arms in the air and get down on your knees and pray hard. Tell God you surrender your will to Him, and no matter what happens, you know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. One day I was tired of being sick and tired and I realized that I had, I had the power and authority okay, to rebuke the sin and to rebuke the strongholds all along to, uh, you know, to use my defensive and offensive weapons in the spirit. And I'm going to keep the enemy from taking what's mine. I'm going to attack the enemy with everything that I have. My full armor of God okay, and uh, everything that God has given me. I'm going to attack the devil where it hurts, in his pocket. Okay, um, when he tries to whisper sweet nothings in my ear. Now Satan is constantly going to be at work, so we need to be on the ball as well. Okay, the devil will whisper sweet nothings in our ear. Okay, if we would, we, but we have to be true, learn how to be true children of God. He won't make us suffer through, God won't make us suffer through so much hell and hot water that we are not. Uh, but this too is a lie. The Bible says that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. God chastises his children, and he loves his children, and his children love him. God is not going to reprimand you or discipline you unless God knows you can handle it. And He's not going to put more on you than you can bear. He disciplines, it's called divine discipline, where He disciplines us all. Okay, but when God penalizes children, it looks like, you know, you're going down for the count. It looks like all hell is breaking loose. And it looks like you may never come up out of that, but that's what it says. It only looks like. God is using those tight, hostile situations and circumstances that He allows to happen in our lives and use them to some antagonistic situations and makes them some the same situations work out for our benefit. Okay, from all fleshly lust which war against the soul, First Peter 2:11, uh, abstain from every form of evil. First Thessalonians 5:22. We all will be tested and tempted, but not beyond what we can bear. God makes sure of that our hearts will be tested. And our thinking pattern will be tested. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black. I've been talking to you about my book, Valley of Dragon and Live Again, Rebuilding the Walls of Our Torn Down Life. We'll be talking about a whole other book, uh, other different subjects about real estate, religion, and you. And you. And you.